Hello and welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Robles. Joining me this week is Wes Hilliard. What's going on, Wes? Hey, Stephen. Glad to be back. Yeah, man. Been a quiet week. Not much going on this week. So. Oh, yeah. Just took a nap yeah. and kind of lounging around. That's right. Nothing going on. So the entire goal of today's episode, Wes, is to help ease my mind about just going with the normal 12 Pro and not the Max. That is what I'm hoping from you, that you will not pressure me into buying the Max for the camera. I don't think I'll be able to help you with that at all. All right, we're going to get that. That's really, honestly, I've been doing so much research and like reading camera people and what they're having to say about the Max. So we will get to that in a moment. If you missed our recap episode, I recorded an episode right after the event on Tuesday the 13th. And so if you'd like to hear just kind of all the announcements from the event, kind of rapid fire, everything that Apple talked about, I encourage you to check out that. That's the last episode in the feed, the previous episode right here on the Apple Insider Podcast. So we won't go through all that details again to rehash it, but there's some features I definitely want to point out and kind of go into farther depth on some topics. Before we get into all the event stuff, though, because this also came out this week, was the iPad Air release date leak. I know of all the things, probably more people excited about the phones than the iPad Air, but for those of you who are interested, Best Buy in Canada leaked the launch date of the new iPad Air with that Touch ID side button, October 23rd, possibly, and a possible pre-order as you listen to this, October 16th, which seems a little strange to have the pre-order the same day as the iPhone 12 stuff, but it's a possibility. But it's looking like next week that iPad Air will finally be available. Yeah, I think this happened before with uh, one of the original iPad Pro models. You, I had to try and determine if I wanted to race for the iPhone or the iPad in my pre-order process, uh, and it, it, it was a mess. But <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, tomorrow should be interesting. Yes, we were going to talk about the phones in a second. Let, real quick, let's touch on the HomePod Mini. Now, if you want to hear all about the the intercom feature and kind of the HomeKit functionality of it. Andrew and I have an episode coming out Monday on HomeKit Insider. Andrew actually tested the intercom feature. He actually has a video up on appleinsider.com showing kind of all the features of the intercom stuff. So you can check that out. But HomePod Mini, $99, November 6th pre-order, November 16th availability. Looks like a really cool device. Wes, you going to grab one to 18 of these? What do you think? Um, I think two, at least to start. I mean, I'll probably end up with at least two more later. I already have four regular sized home pods placed around my house. So hiding some of these in some nooks and crannies and uh, maybe getting one for my mom would be pretty cool. That would be cool. A couple of pieces of information that's come out since the event. Number one, If you have a regular HomePod, the 299 large version, you cannot create a stereo pair with a mini and a regular one. You have to have either two regular HomePods or two minis to have a stereo pair. So you can mix and match. I don't know why you'd want to mix them anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you just have one of each, you'd think. but, But anyway, so you can't stereo pair them. Apple actually confirmed with The Verge, and I'll put this article in the show notes, that they're going to bring Dolby Atmos support to HomePod. And if you have a stereo pair of HomePods, Apple's saying it can do just one HomePod, but it's much better with two. You can actually have a cinema experience with two HomePods and virtual surround, setting up those two regular HomePods with Dolby Atmos, but you cannot do that with the new HomePod Mini. You can only do that with the regular size HomePods. So no home cinema on the Mini. No stereo pairs mix and matched, but you do get the wideband and you do get the uh, intercom features on the mini. So that's pretty interesting. Well, here's my elevator pitch for that home cinema because I'm in the market for a Dolby Atmos Sono system. Mm. Just staring at that price tag is ugly. One million dollars. It's uh, 1800 if you want all the speakers. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's plenty. Right. Uh, but I have four HomePods. So instead of going out and buying a whole new thing, I can just use what I got but it would only work with the Apple TV. I would really like to use my PlayStation and my my Nintendo Switch right. with this uh, home theater system. So my elevator pitch to Apple is uh, basically make it so I can plug the Apple TV into the ARC port on the back of my TV so I can Ooh. use it on the Apple TV and then when the Apple TV is not in use, have it pass through audio to the other ports. That would be pretty cool. I got to be honest. That's never happened. Yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> I don't know if that will. But come on. I just want it. That would be cool. But it's interesting, too, because I, and my question, Andrew, is this. We don't have an answer right now. But with home cinema support with HomePod, I'm curious if they will allow you to have more than just two. Like, is it just a stereo pair will give you virtual surround? Or can you actually add four or five HomePods for, like, an actual five-speaker real surround setup? Which I'm not sure. They just mentioned virtual surround at this point, I believe. Yeah, they mentioned 5.1 and 7.1 surround audio, but it, it just 
distinguishing between the two means what uh, two speakers versus four. It, it just sounds weird. I'm not sure how they would want to configure this. Yeah, so not a lot of details there. But back to the Mini. The Mini is $99 for the HomePod Mini. You can pre-order it on November 6th, get it November 16th. And I was going to ask you, what do you think of the design? It's kind of like a bowling ball with a flat top. That's how I describe it. It's very small. I I don't mind it. Um, I think it's funny that the glass is a lot bigger on the top, so the colors are just kind of yelling at you. But um, I I like how small it is. It's like palmable in your hand, I'm guessing, is what they were going for. It's really kind of annoying that there's no way to, I don't know, pair it with a battery base station and carry it around or something. But Mm. I've actually carried my HomePod, the big one, to hotels and stuff during like weekend stays with friends. Yeah. So this is definitely much more of an option for that. (laughs) Yeah, that's funny. No, and I've moved mine around too because it's big, but it's not too bad. But yeah, that screen on top is curious because on the normal HomePod, when you invoke Siri, you get that little colorful cloud that represents that Siri is listening. And it kind of is in the middle of that top screen, but it doesn't envelop the entire screen. Where on the HomePod Mini, it looks like that entire screen becomes the Siri color cloud. And I don't know if it's physically the same size as like regular HomePod to HomePod Mini, but just because it's a smaller screen on the Mini, it makes it bigger. I don't know. I I think that's a a weird difference between the two. But So anyway, that was the HomePod Mini, but let's get into what everyone's really probably interested in, the iPhone 12, 12 mini, 12 pro, and 12 pro max. We basically got four iPhones. And we'll talk about the pros in a second because there are some differences, especially when it comes to the camera on the pro models. And also at the end of the show, we'll talk about kind of upgrade and like how you can go about upgrading it or buying one of the new phones and pre-orders and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the 12 and 12 mini, it has that new design, flat edges, Looks really nice. They got some new colors. One is like a light seafoam green, and that looks pretty cool. What do you think of the design when you saw it? I mean, we kind of had it leaked already, but... No surprises here. I am mean, the even the camera system's pretty much identical to the previous generation as far as the 12 and 12 mini are concerned. I like that they kind of went no holds bar on the screen, the display, because, I mean, every iPhone is now OLED, uh, They so they were able to right. get closer to the edge, that flat sides, make it even, you know, more of a stunning effect. And, I mean, we've, we've heard all about this and seen renders, but having Apple finally show us the real thing, we can kind of just see what it really looks like. And uh, I don't think we were expecting it to be quite... Uh, as dramatic as a change as this because I mean we're going from the 10r 11 having kind of um, much thicker noticeable bezel around the edge to what is a much bigger uh, screen to body ratio now right and what's also interesting is that the 12 and 12 mini which has that 5.1 screen size very small physical dimensions is smaller than the current se has all the same features same oled screen same cameras as the 12 and has the same 5G. So, you know, if you're looking at that iPhone 12 mid-range models, you really just choose the size because you actually get the exact same features. Now, one of the things they announced too is that ceramic shield technology. And so I've kind of been looking into what that means. And Corning Glass, which is the company that works on this glass technology, they make Gorilla Glass and has made the glass on previous iPhones. They actually have an article on their website, uh, probably because... Apple was announcing this and they knew people might be searching for it. But there's a whole article on Corning in their material science that talks about ceramic and the difference between ceramic and glass ceramics and all that. So I'll put that link in show notes. That's to the Corning website. You can read about their glass technology and all that. But it should be a much more shatter resistant screen unknown about scratch resistance. And again, you've heard that, you know, sometimes when the shatter proofing gets better, the scratch resistance gets worse, which is unfortunate, but remains to be seen about this new ceramic technology. I'm sure we'll have tons of drop tests on YouTube the Monday after these iPhones uh, get shipped. I don't know. Do you drop your phones, Wes? You're probably not even worried about it. Um, I go caseless. I've Ooh. dropped my phone on carpets and stuff. Uh, never really had any problems with that. I've never, I've never shattered a screen. I think one time it touched a corner on some asphalt in a parking lot and uh, I had a little chip. So I went and got that repaired in like an iPhone seven. Yeah. With, with these things, I'm not too worried about it. The ceramic shield that they're, that they've built for this phone sounds really interesting to me. I mean, I had to study a lot of material uh, science uh, while I was in the Navy, kind of understand what they're going for here. Hmm. There's no way you can have just pure glass and make it 
more scratch resistant and more durable to drops at the same time. You're, when you increase your ability to drops, you're going to make it very scratchy, right? Mm. Yeah, it, it's an opposite relationship. So by adding in that ceramic doping to the glass, you're basically removing the need to, you're, you're increasing durability without changing the scratch resistance. Okay. So what they've done here, and what I'm assuming, they haven't said officially, is adding in the ceramic to last year's glass, and that's why they mentioned it as iPhone 11, having the best glass in an iPhone. Uh, it's already very scratch resistant, but now with the ceramic, it's very durable against drops. So you have the best of both worlds. Very cool. Well, and also, now this applies to all iPhone 12s, no charger or headphones in the case. And Samsung and other phone manufacturers were quick to jump on that, saying, don't worry, we still got our power bricks in the case, in the box, which in the next couple of years, you'll probably see those disappear now too. But I'm, I was curious, your thoughts on this. You know, obviously I have so many little plugs around. It's not a big deal. And I think for 75% of people, you know, even if you had an Android phone previously, you have those little power bricks everywhere. But I do imagine there's going to be some customers who get that phone and it's going to be a little bit of a hassle looking for a power brick with USB-C because that's the other notable thing is it comes with a USB-C to lightning cable, not a USB-A to lightning cable. And th that's also kind of interesting because previous iPhones, the 11 and earlier, comes with that 5-watt power brick with USB-A. But now you get that mid-range 12 and it comes with USB-C, you might not have a USB-C power brick. You know, if you've been on that mid-range cycle for a long time. So I'm curious what that outcry is going to be from people who get their phones in the next six months and have to buy that power brick separately. Now, Apple lowered the price of their earphones and the power bricks by $10 in the store, but it's still a thing where it's not going to come with that iPhone. I don't know, man. What do you think about that? So this affects two very specific groups of people, people who've never owned a USB-C phone ever uh, or or any device, or they're, it's going to affect anyone who's never bought a USB-C uh, iPhone, like a, the iPhone 11 Pro came with the, the USB-C cable. So right. people coming into this with zero power bricks is going to come out, you know, notice, oh no, how am I going to charge my phone? I'll, I guess I'm going to have to go spend $20 more, you know, bad, bad Apple, it's terrible. I don't know if it's going to be much of an outcry. I mean, anyone who's going iPhone to iPhone, they already have lightning cables and adapters. Sure, it's the USB-A adapter and stuff, but all the stuff they already have in place will charge their phone. Wireless charging also works. I'm sure we'll hear it from the usual suspects complaining about how this is very inconvenient, but you can buy some very capable chargers for very little money. Uh, we actually did. It should be out by the time you're listening to this uh, little 10 device article about the top 10 uh, USB-C plugs you can buy. Mm. And like the Amazon Basics adapter, uh, USB-C with 18 watt charging, which is fast charging for the iPhone, is like $14. Okay. So we're not talking about a whole bunch of money and you're already getting whatever, you, if you spend more than 10 bucks, you're getting better than anything Apple would have shipped with the iPhone anyway. Right. Now also Anchor, they released a $20 nano charger they're calling it it's a 20 watt USB-C, and it's almost exactly the same size as the old five watt iphone power brick so you can also get that for twenty dollars yeah. yeah that's included in the article that that thing's really cool yeah. i think them being able to just pack everything into that little bitty square just shows how long apple's been sitting on this five watt adapter <laughs> right I, I am curious though to hear from people who maybe this is their first iPhone or don't have a USB-C brick, you know, kind of what that reaction is. I'm sure if someone goes into an Apple store to buy it, you know, those Apple employees are going to press super hard to be like, listen, you know, this does not come with a brick, you know, so I'm sure they'll check it. But the people that buy online, which maybe that's the more tech savvy people anyway, that's just buying an iPhone without going into a store, they might already have a brick. So maybe it doesn't matter as much. Well, you already know it, it, they're not going to be pushing the brick. They're going to be pushing MagSafe. Right. Which you need a brick for anyway, though. <laughs> you need a brick mm, for MagSafe. Good, good point. I wonder if that cable comes with a brick. I bet it doesn't. No, it does not. It does ah. not. That's the thing where, yeah, people were talking about that, where you can buy the MagSafe cable, which is $29, but it does not come with its own brick. This episode is brought to you by Clean My Mac X. Clean My Mac X is an all-in-one cleaning and optimizing software for your Mac. Listen, if you've been using Macs for a long time, you know that over time, they're going to need a little maintenance. They might get a little slow. You might get some random files here and there. 
Well, Clean My Mac X is a cleaning utility. You install it on your Mac and it can declutter your Mac, your MacBook, even your Mac Pro. It runs necessary maintenance scripts and it keeps your Mac's performance at its peak. It's a super easy, user-friendly app that works wonders on your Mac. And especially if you have an older Mac, it can really help speed up and breathe new life into that old cluttered Mac. One of the things I love about Clean My Mac X is it's beautifully designed. I love when a utility app also looks great. They really care about every detail. So I love installing it and running it. It just looks great and it's super easy to use. One of my favorite features too is when I delete an app, I wanna make sure that all the files associated with that app also get removed from my Mac. And with Clean My Mac X, it does exactly that. If you wanna delete an app, uninstall an app, it'll make sure all those random library and support files go with it and there's not some random files left over. The most popular feature for Clean My Mac X is the Smart Scan. It examines your entire system for log files and cache files that are no longer needed. It also does a quick malware check and runs optimization tasks and all of that in just a couple seconds. Another superpower of Clean My Mac X is its ability to handle performance draining processes. So if you feel like your Mac is chugging away and you don't know what activity is in the background, don't open Activity Monitor. You can get way more details and a much more straightforward view of what's going on with Clean My Mac X. It gives you more control over apps, their files, and what programs you have on your Mac, and you can uninstall the ones you don't need. And Clean My Mac X is getting ready to be fully compatible with macOS Big Sur when it comes out. I love Clean My Mac X and I think you should try it too. Learn more about Clean My Mac X and you can download it for free. You got a free trial at macpaw.app/insider. That's m a c p a w .app/insider. Go to that link Download Clean My Mac X for free. Try it out. You're going to love it. Our thanks to Clean My Mac X for sponsoring this episode. MagSafe Charger, you can't buy it now, but I'm sure you'll be able to buy it starting as you're listening to this actually today, probably with the iPhone 12 pre-orders going live. But the MagSafe Charger is $39, but it does not come with a power brick. It says 20 watt USB-C power adapter sold separately. So the only thing you get in the box when you buy that MagSafe charger for $39 is the little puck that attaches to the back of your phone and the end of the cable with the USB-C and nothing to plug that into. So while, yeah, it's an upsell, it's still not an answer for those who need a brick. Yeah, Apple pricing here and uh, removing stuff from the box, a lot of people are going to take it as user hostile. They're, they're going to completely ignore and not even care about the environmental stuff, which is fine. Customers usually don't pay attention to that stuff except for more savvy people. I mean, like, why isn't it in the box? Oh, it's because Apple wants me to buy a charger. That's why. And that's the conclusion most people are going to reach. They're going to grumble and then they're going to buy a charger, probably from Walmart or a gas station. It, it just comes down to, do you want to spend... $20 on this charger on Amazon or $50 on this one that does the same thing from Apple. And yeah. you know, the brand kind of defeats itself at that point. But now as we're talking about MagSafe, this is very cool the technology. A lot of people are almost more excited about MagSafe than anything else from the announcement. So again, the, the terminology comes from that old MagSafe charger for MacBooks and MacBook Pros, which I was always very fond of. But now it is the wireless charging technology for the iPhone the noticeable difference between MagSafe charging, well, two things, and normal Qi charging is one, you don't have to worry about placement because the MagSafe charger will automatically snap exactly to the right place, which is super convenient. And then you don't have to worry about it charging or not charging. But also the MagSafe charger, you get 15 watts of power charging, which is faster charging than normal Qi charging, which you only get seven watts. So you get faster charging with the... MagSafe charger is 15 watts as opposed to Qi charging 7 watts. So I'm I'm very curious. I imagine with third-party MagSafe adapters, like Belkin announced their MagSafe products, those probably also get 15 watts. And so that'll be a faster charging than like the Nomad style Qi charging. But I have to imagine Nomad's going to come out with some MagSafe Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, third parties can build with it. Um, obviously, we've already seen some products uh, getting teased out before the announcement. Well, after the announcement, 15 watts is a standard. So you, it's not like some company is going to come out here and be like, here's a 30 watt MagSafe charger. No, but users are going to notice a big difference here because a lot of people it, use those little five watt bricks. This is three times faster than the standard brick that's come with the iPhone for the last decade. So, right. And this is wireless charging. Right. And uh, I wanted to ask you, do you or any of your friends or relatives 
ever completely destroy their lightning cable because they lay down <laughs> and then lean their iPhone on their chest with the cable underneath it and then just rip it apart. I have seen so many lightning cables torn to shreds and it really boggles my mind because again, I, I am one to keep my technology things in pristine order. But yes, I've seen many people, even some that like will plug it in and then kind of like wrap the cable around the back of the iPhone and kind of hold the cable so it like doesn't come out. But so they'll use their phone and that lightning cable is just taunt almost from the bottom. And yes, I've seen many ripped to shreds. There, so. There's a whole industry of cable holders shaped like little animals that keep the cable from bending while you're laying down. It's <laughs> right. it's insane. But MagSafe, and this is, this is going to be huge for people who actually go out and buy it, is... You just snap it to the back and keep using your phone while wirelessly charging it, which is the huge complaint I've heard from everyone from my 12-year-old niece all the way up to my 65-year-old mother that's saying, I can't <laughs> charge my phone and use it at the same time. What's the point of wireless charging? And it's this solves that, and I hope right. they don't find a way to break the cable while they use it too. Right. Now, I will be very interested in that Apple Watch and iPhone MagSafe charger that Apple showed that they are making. But I do really want to see what Nomad does and what some of the other third parties do with MagSafe. I know you have that kind of Nomad three device charging pad. I know a bunch of Apple Insider staff people. I've seen Amber have one too. You know, I was close to getting one recently and I was like, let me just wait and see. And now I'm glad I did because I feel like they're surely they're going to come out with some MagSafe option that'll be sweet. I like the idea of the iPhone hovering around. I think uh, Belkin, we discussed, had that new three charging hub. Right. I like the idea of having the desk side things with where you just snap the iPhone to the side of it. And now it's charging, it's displaying no cable fuss or anything like that. And it's easy to just pick up and walk off. That's going to be a huge thing. And uh, now I'm thinking I'm going to have to replace the guy on my desk here <laughs> just so I can do that. <laughs> That's right. What's interesting about MagSafe though, is it's not just about power. It also has a couple of other things in it. Uh, there's an NFC chip just for MagSafe built into the coils for uh, the iPhone. So when you attach accessories, it can talk to the accessory while it's attached and understand what you just attached to it. Right. So you'll get a little notification when you attach a wallet or a case, and that notification will show up depending on the color of what you just attached. So a lot more little customizations and uh, just whimsy going on there. That's very cool. So a couple of things on the iPhone 12 and 12 mini. There are leather cases coming. That was something that Apple didn't really announce and wasn't on the website available to peruse yet, the leather cases. But it was confirmed that leather cases will be coming in November for the 12 and 12 Pro and all that. The silicone cases are what are available now. And so if you need a case and you're pre-ordering an iPhone today, then, you know, silicone is going to have to go with. But there are leather ones coming. And before we move on to 5G, which I want to spend a few minutes on, talking about the difference between the 12 and 12 Pro, if you're looking to pre-order something, again, you can get the iPhone 12, the mini is not until November, and you can get the 12 Pro, the 12 Pro Max is not available in November. But between the 12 and 12 Pro, uh, it was came out that the RAM in both those models are actually different. So if you get a regular iPhone 12 or 12 mini that comes with four gigabytes of RAM, where the 12 Pro and Pro Max will be coming with six gigabytes of RAM. So that's a big difference there. Obviously, the band around the edges of the phone, it's aluminum on the 12, stainless steel on the 12 Pro. You do not get the ultra-wide lens on the regular Pro. That's also reserved for the Pro and Pro Max. And the sensor increase on the max and some of the other you know enhancements that are coming on the pro cameras you also do not get those on the regular 12 so what are you losing if you go with a regular 12 model thankfully you're not losing the oled technology because that's now there so on the regular iphone 12 you get the wide and ultra wide lenses you don't get the telephoto where on the iphone 12 pro you have the wide, ultra-wide, and the telephoto. And on the Max, you actually have a brand new telephoto lens, which is 2.5x. And what, again, we'll talk about the camera difference between the Pro and Pro Max in a second. But So you lose the stainless steel sides, you get aluminum, you lose the telephoto lens on the iPhone 11, and you get 4 gigs of RAM instead of 6 gigabytes. Any other glaring differences between the models that I'm missing? I think uh, LiDAR. Did you mention LiDAR? Oh, that's right. And of course, LiDAR is not on the 12 and 12 mini. LiDAR is reserved for the iPhone 12 Pro and 12 Pro Max. But the LiDAR is both on the Pro and Pro Max, which is nice. So those are the main differences if you're interested in going 12 or 12 Pro. What's nice is there was rumors before the event that there might only be the ultra-wideband 
millimeter wave technology in some iPhone models, but that is not the case. When it comes to 5G, every iPhone 12 has all the 5G capabilities. Whether you go from the iPhone 12 mini, the regular 12, 12 Pro or 12 Max, all of them are capable of 5G and the ultra wideband, at least here in the United States. I think in the UK and elsewhere, 5G is not rolling out as fast. And so there is no ultra wideband. But the 5G thing is is an interesting animal. And so it was kind of weird. I don't think we've seen a carrier on stage in an Apple event in quite a while. Am I right in thinking that? A car- no, uh, I don't think we've seen a carrier probably since Verizon was added to the iPhone. Right, right. So it's curious. Uh, you know, it felt a little weird to have that back where Apple is kind of pushing this one carrier. And I don't know if Verizon paid Apple a certain amount of money or if Apple is, you know, telling Verizon to give prominent placements of the 12 in the stores. I don't know what kind of deal there was there, but it seems strange to have a U.S. wireless carrier be headlined in this keynote, where again, the iPhone 12 is going to be available in lots of different countries. But for some reason, Verizon was highlighted. iPhone 12 brought to you by Verizon. (laughs) Which is, uh, yeah, I just thought it felt weird. So let's talk about 5G, Wes. So we have various forms of 5G across the carriers. Now, I don't have all the details about 5G in other countries. So forgive me, listeners, if you're in the UK or elsewhere. Maybe I'll ask William to give me an update on that next week. But in regards to the United States and the 5G networks via the carriers, I'm going to talk about the big three, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. All are claiming to have 5G network nationwide coverage. That nationwide coverage, again, depending on the terminology of the carrier, because they all call it different things, that like regular the medium spectrum band 5G, not like the ultra wide band millimeter wave, regular 5G coverage. It looks like Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile have decent, okay coverage and it's growing. T-Mobile claims it has the largest 5G coverage because it used Sprint's towers and theirs in the merger. You know, all of them cover like major cities and all that kind of stuff. But then we get to the ultra wide band millimeter wave technology. And this was called something different for each carrier. Verizon is calling the nationwide 5G versus the ultra wideband millimeter. So their terminology is nationwide 5G and ultra wideband. They're kind of using the actual technical name. AT&T, which is actually my carrier, is just calling it 5G versus 5G plus, which the 5G plus is that ultra wideband millimeter wave technology. The regular 5G is just 5G. And it's also infuriating because on my AT&T iPhone, I actually get 5G E as a network option in some places. And it's maddening because it's definitely not 5G. Did did you see that survey where 50% of iPhone owners thought they already had 5G in their iPhone? (sighs) See, that's just, that's just sad. That's the carrier's fault though. That's all on AT&T and Verizon. Absolutely. Yeah, that's crazy. And then T-Mobile, I'm actually going to include the link to their statement because they actually have a long article that came out on October 13th, the day of the iPhone event. And this long article is basically saying we don't have an ultra wideband network. T-Mobile is like, we bet on going full in to that mid-range, mid-band 5G network. We're not doing the ultra wideband. We're not doing the millimeter wave, at least not now or, or any plans to. They're just focusing on coverage. And that's why they're saying they had the largest 5G network at the moment. So they're not even calling their ultra wide. They, they don't have one. Well, if you wanted to be clear, though, Verizon and AT&T, they don't have a 5G millimeter wave network either. They just have a dozen stadiums in a few big cities with, you know, if you're standing in the middle of the ballpark, you can get 5G plus. But right. I wouldn't really call that a network either. Yeah, fair enough. So now what what carrier are you on? I use Verizon. Okay, so you are on Verizon. So I'm going to put in the article for the podcast that Verizon and AT&T are claiming are ultra wideband in Verizon's case or 5G plus in AT&T's case. So these are the cities that supposedly have that ultra wideband millimeter wave technology. Verizon has, I don't know, something like 15 to 20 cities. Uh, Sarasota, Florida being one of them. I was kind of trying to see which ones I might be able to go to. And then AT&T has a list of cities, a little bit shorter of a list, again, kind of in that teens range, but you have, you know, New York, Las Vegas, Atlanta, and they supposedly say in Florida, Jacksonville, Miami, and Orlando all have the 5G+. And so listeners, I am in Central Florida, and so I will do you the service of when my iPhone 12 Pro comes in, I will go to either Jacksonville or Orlando or somewhere and test this supposed ultra-wideband 
in Orlando or something. So anyway, I will put the list of cities in the show notes and in the article, and I'll also put links to their coverage maps, which you can look at the coverage maps of Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile and see if by chance 5G is in your area. This episode is brought to you by the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower. That's right. You heard me correctly. Here's the deal. I have this Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower in my house, and I absolutely love it. The Nebbia company was actually founded by one of the engineers on the original iPhone team. Not only that, but Nebbia's first investor was actually Apple CEO Tim Cook. The Nebbia story starts in Mexico City, where there were water shortage problems, and they came to Silicon Valley to raise money and figure out how they can save water while still providing an incredible shower experience. Nebbia has currently saved over 175 million gallons of water. So here's the deal. You can actually save money by using the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower. If you go to the Nebbia website, and we'll put the link in show notes so you can check it out, there's actually a calculator, and it can tell you how much money you'll save by using the Nebbia by Moen. Honestly, in most cases, it pays for itself in less than a year. You get the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower, and listen, I'm not a super do-it-yourself kind of guy, but I was able to install this by myself under 15 minutes. So don't be intimidated by the installation. It is super easy to install. They give you incredible instructions and all the parts you need to get it up in your shower quickly. It's unbelievable that it saves 45% of water compared to a standard shower, but still has two times greater coverage. It feels like a super powerful spray force. It rinses incredibly well. Even the thickest shampoos, it has no problem rinsing all of that. And it feels great. I learned a new term from the Nebula by Moen people. The thermal comfort of a shower. I don't know about you, but that's very important to me. I want my shower to feel great and be hot. And the Nebula by Moen Spa Shower feels amazing. You can also get it with this wand that attaches to this little like magnet dome thing in your shower. Honestly, it's awesome. I love it. As a matter of fact... My three kids actually love the Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower, too. So here's their review. It's amazing. I love the shower. I rate it a 5 out of 5 because I like the wand. The Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower starts at just $1.99, and they also have incredible accessories and shower shelves to match. It comes in beautiful finishes. I got the nickel finish, so it's fingerprint proof, and it looks great in my shower. Now, Nebbia normally does not do sales of any kind, so this is a special deal. This is just for Apple Insider listeners. The first 100 listeners who respond to this will get 15% off anything on the Nebbia website, including that spa shower that I'm talking about. Go to nebbia.com and use the promo code Apple Insider, all one word, and get 15% off anything you buy on that Nebbia website right now. So go to nebbia.com slash Apple Insider. Take a look at everything and then use the coupon code Apple Insider when checking out. That's nebbia.com slash Apple Insider for 15% off everything on their website. Our thanks to Nebbia by Moen for sponsoring this episode. To comment more on 5G though, it's interesting. I mean, it's not, I don't think it, too many people were clamoring for faster speeds unless you were stuck in 3G in a farm. Um, <laughs> sorry the, to all the, the farmers who listen to sorry, the Apple Insider podcast. <laughs> no, no insult to the farmer. It's not no, your no, fault that they, they didn't run the lines to you. But right. um, the thing about 5G and the thing about the iPhone with 5G is that you're not going to know unless you're standing there looking at your phone look at that signal bar, make sure it's 5G, and then run a speed test right there on the spot. <laughs> right. You're not going to know that you're running 5G, 4G, or 5G+, plus because the way the iPhone's going to do this is it's going to change what speed it's using depending on what you're doing. So if you're downloading, downloading an app, I don't even know that it'll bother kicking in 5G unless it just detects uh, lag in the 4G network. You know, if you're, if you're actively, like Apple was talking about gaming, if you're on League of Legends in the middle of a park trying to play, right. sure, maybe you'll <laughs> kick in some 5G. But I don't see users even noticing. Like, they're, they're not going to go to their friends and be like, guys, I just downloaded 30 music albums and a 4k movie down here <laughs> at the laundromat. It's crazy. It, I don't see it happening. Yeah. The, and the examples Apple showed in like their promotional videos during the keynote was downloading an album of music or downloading a movie and maybe playing a multiplayer game, which you can't really show off the speed because you just look like you're playing a game. But what it did show, I feel like it showed it like five or six times in the video of like you download a music album and you see the little circles around each song fill up super fast. Or you download a movie and you see that fill up super fast. But 
real life, yes, I agree. You're not going to notice. And also, <laughs> there was that disclaimer every time Apple mentioned a speed was in ideal conditions. Every time it talked about four gig or five gig or anything, it's if you have ideal conditions. So it feels like if there's too many trees or if there's wind blowing, you might not get that 300 down like you're thinking you're going to get. Right. And what's what's interesting here is, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to hate on 5G. It's going to be great for a lot of use cases. Yeah. I mean, Pokemon Go is not going to look it's going to look way better when you're able to just go out here with a AR headset on. 5G is a future technology. We're 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 waiting for crazy stuff to happen where information is going to literally be beaming down to you from the internet c- continuously, you know, over a signal. Right. But right now, it's a little meh and that's fine. We 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 just need to wait and see exactly how uh, we're going to implement this. I mean, I remember the same conversations happening when LTE came out and everyone's like, "Who could possibly want 10 megabits per second download speeds on their phone? What are they doing <laughs> right and again the the thing is people you know i've heard this somewhere else i forgot what podcast i was listening to but people keep their iphones for a long time you know those of us kind of in the tech world we might upgrade every two years or every year but people who keep it for four or five years they will be able to benefit from the 5g that are, is three or four years from now so you know it, this is good that the iphones have it you know I'm, we're not downplaying it i'm glad that apple announced a feature that will help battery life You know, that whole like smart data thing where if you don't need the 5G, it's not going to connect to it. I think that is key to saving battery life. And I just, I cannot wait for someone to do a battery test to take an iPhone 12 mini in the middle of a park in one of the ultra wideband millimeter wave cities and try to play that League of Legends over 5G, full brightness screen, iPhone 12 mini. I'm thinking 15 minutes. Half an hour. I think that's all you get. (laughs) have an hour like i cannot and i cannot imagine the heat that phone is going to put off from that kind of pulling of data and and stuff so anyway that's 5g i'm going to put links in show notes to the coverage maps for verizon at&t and t-mobile here in the states and that article that t-mobile talked about 5g and so you can learn all about that there and if you believe that 5g is a conspiracy or hoax i'm sorry i don't have any links for you it doesn't cause covid (laughs) It definitely doesn't cause COVID, uh, but Wes, is uh, he's free on Twitter to answer all of your 5G conspiracy theories. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I love that. All right. So now we come to the iPhone 12 Pro and the Pro Max. So this was something that we talked about in the preview of the event last week in the episode. And what was coming up was that there's going to be some difference between something in the Pro and the Pro Max. And it looks like the camera system is, in fact, possibly significantly different between these two phones. So we do get slightly larger screen sizes than the 11 and 11 Pro. It's 6.1 and now 6.7 inches, supposedly in the same body dimensions because there's less bezels. So it's not too much of a larger phone, physical dimension footprint wise. Supposedly 20% faster than the iPhone 11 Pro thanks to the A14 Bionic, which is in every iPhone 12, the mini, the regular, all that. And we also get the LiDAR in the 12 Pro and we get the stainless steel and we get new colors that kind of gold color and that blue color. Well, we've had gold before. This gold looks like jewelry style gold. I don't know. How do you feel about that gold? Are you going to go that gold version? Oh, no. Um, I mean, (laughs) the way it reflects light is pretty cool. I like the way they showed it off in the video. Uh, I'll have to see it in real life. Yeah. I'm sure my mom would love it. Right. Yeah. It it does look like an attractive phone if you like that kind of gold. But the big story here is the cameras. Now, one of the things we talk about is the Apple Pro Raw like image format that Apple announced, but this is not coming at launch. This is coming in a future update. So we can't really talk. There's not a whole lot to talk about there. I think it's a very cool feature. I think it's a big deal for those who edit their photos in Photoshop or Lightroom after they take it. So it's a very cool feature. Excited that they put that in there. And, you know, we would love to hear from photographers once they start using that feature. And about the LiDAR, The exciting thing about the LiDAR is while augmented reality will get a boost in like use and worthwhileness, the LiDAR is really going to help in focusing the camera in low light situations. So we're excited to try low light photography and you can do portraits now in low light. Curious how that LiDAR will focus, how fast that will be with some of that low light portrait photography and how that all works. Like, I think that's going to be great. The LiDAR should be fun just for several reasons. I mean, the fact that it can work in the dark, it doesn't, it needs pretty much 1% light to function and uh, it'll work fine. So that the night mode photography we're going to see with this new phone should be pretty intense. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. But now we come to the sensor optical image stabilization 
and the telephoto lens. Those are the three things that are significantly different between the iPhone 12 Pro and the iPhone 12 Pro Max. Now, I think I said in my recap episode something about just the ultra-wide getting the optical image stabilization, but that was not the case. Uh, It's not the ultra-wide. And I wish, again, I just got confused early as we were recording this. I almost wish that we would call it like the normal or the default lens, the ultra-wide and the telephoto, because wide and ultra-wide gets confused sometimes, and just myself. But anyway, the iPhone 12 Pro Max has a 47% larger sensor for the default camera lens, the wide lens. So when you open that camera app, the lens that it defaults to, the wide one where you take probably most of your pictures with, the sensor in the max is 47% larger than the regular 12 Pro. And that much increase in size of a sensor is going to mean that it's going to capture way more light, but also just going to have larger pixels, greater detail, and it's going to probably be a significantly better photo experience than on the regular 12 Pro. And that's like for most of the photos you take. And you do not get that sensor increase size in the regular 12 Pro. And I was dreading this decision (laughs) because if you want that huge sensor, you have to go with the Max. There's no way around it. Do you think it's going to actually have a significant effect on like real world picture taking and like noticeably different images between the 12 Pro and the 12 Pro Max? Absolutely. I mean... If you, You're killing me, Wes. You were supposed to say, nah, it'll be fine. <laughs> if you've ever touched a camera, even on the iPhone, you'll notice how it compensates for brightness. So if you're outside and you're taking a photo on your wide-angle lens, broad daylight, it's going to be beautiful, crisp, perfect. Every bl- blade of grass is visible, but tone that down to dusk and you might as well be standing on asphalt or grass. You can't tell the difference. There's no detail and it's all big noise bubbles, right? So it's big grains all over the place. That's because there's not enough light getting to the sensor, but this thing's getting, I think Apple said 88% more light per photo, which is basically like doubling the size of your lens uh, on the camera. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be a pretty intense difference. I mean, we're still not uh, at the level of like going out here and getting a full frame DSLR, but it's getting very close and in such a compact size. I, it's unbelievable what they've done here. Yeah. Well, that in conjunction with in the Max version only, the optical image stabilization is now on the sensor directly. So as your hand is moving around or shaking, the optical image stabilization is actually moving the sensor around, which this is how some DSLRs and mirrorless cameras do it. And moving the sensor around instead of moving the physical lens around to stabilize, it can actually make more movements per second. And it's basically five times more movements. And that gives you a greater ability to stabilize the photo that you're taking. And so you have a much better optical image stabilization system and a much larger sensor, not to mention the telephoto lens is actually stronger or like, you know, a different millimeter. So you actually get two and a half X on that telephoto. But for me, looking at image quality, just general image quality, I feel like that larger sensor and the optical image stabilization on the sensor instead of the lens is going to make a big difference. And I've seen lots of photographers talking about this. I'll put links in show notes to some of the like commentators who are actual photographers that are talking about this. And while they haven't had their hands on it and they haven't been able to test it, they are extremely excited about these changes that are in the Max model only. And Wes, I mean... This this is going to be pretty great. I mean, I... I use my uh, DSLR from time to time to do family events and, you know, go to conventions and such and shoot photos, but I, I just pull it out so much less often. And now I've even contemplated now just seeing this thinking like I can probably do my product photography for the website with the iPhone. I probably don't even need to pull out the Sony. We'll see. But I mean, the, the stuff they're doing with deep fusion, all four cameras have deep fusion now, which combine that with smart HDR like every single picture you take is getting nine stops of exposure and color bracketing. And it's, it's nuts. I mean, thinking about doing that with a DSLR by myself, we're talking about a half hour process of shooting the photo and taking different stops on a tripod and then taking it to software and editing it. And Apple's doing this in a second on their iPhone. Yeah. So I'm very interested to see what third parties do with the, these new cameras. I mean, Halide, uh, the developer over there is already yeah. drooling on Twitter. Right. Yeah, I can't wait. 
Apple Pro Raw, all in on that one. I'm, it's going to be really cool. This is what I was afraid of because I do not prefer the larger size iPhone. But if you want all the camera advances this year in the iPhone 12 line, you really don't have a choice. You have to go with the Max model because the regular 12 Pro just does not have the same improvements. It does not get the larger sensor or the sensor stabilizing, optical image stabilization on the sensor or the more powerful telephoto lens. So, man. And you'll have to wait to November too. Pre-orders for the iPhone 12 Pro Max don't come until November 6th. Only the regular iPhone 12, not mini, and the iPhone 12 Pro not max available for pre-order today. If you listen to this as it comes out. So we will see. I am very excited to see the camera comparisons and the photography examples. Once these phones get in people's hands, I always look for Austin Mann. I don't know if you've heard of him, but Austin Mann is a professional photographer and he kind of does the iPhone comparison year over year on his website. He goes to some distant locale, some other country, and takes incredible photos with the iPhone. I really cannot wait to see what he does with the Pro Max. Yeah, that should be really cool. I, I mean, I'm definitely going to be doing my own testing. I can't wait because once once I have that phone, I'm going to go out with uh, my Sony. It's not the biggest and best Sony, but I mean, it still should perform better than uh, a phone. And I'm, I'm going to see what I can do between the two devices. It should be interesting. All right. Well, I want to round out the show with how to upgrade to the new iPhone. Now, if you listen to this, like the moment it comes out, you might be listening to this before pre-orders are live. (laughs) So good on you if you actually listen to it. But there are several ways you can upgrade or buy the new iPhone. So you can always pre-order the iPhone and just buy it outright. You just pay the $1,000 if you're getting the 12 Pro, or you pay the $799 if you're getting the regular 12. You can just pay it outright. You have the phone. You own it. Done. So you always have that option to buy the new phone. But if you want to do any kind of monthly installment or upgrade plan, then you have multiple options. And I actually am on the iPhone upgrade plan that's through Apple. And I got this cryptic email (laughs) that it said, you know, get ready for your pre-order. And you can do this if you're on the iPhone upgrade plan through Apple. You can actually do this like pre-pre-order where you actually choose the phone and model you want you do like the credit check because it's actually kind of a loan through Citizens One. I'll explain in a second. And you can usually get like pre-approved. So then the morning of, you just press one button and you order the phone that you chose already. But I got this email talking about like the pre-pre-order. And it says, you can choose your preferred iPhone and monthly payment option with Apple Card monthly installments, the iPhone upgrade program, or Apple iPhone payments. And so they give you these three options, which is very curious, but I think I've, deciphered them. Wes, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think Apple Card monthly installments. If you buy it with an Apple Card, if you buy one of the new iPhone 12s with your Apple Card, you can basically pay 0% interest on that purchase and just pay the monthly installment. And Apple tells you what that monthly price is when you buy the phone on that. And that's if you do it with your Apple Card. So uh, basically 0% interest monthly payment on your Apple Card, but you will be carrying the balance of the phone on your Apple Card. That's one. Number two Apple iPhone payments, which is a weird terminology, but I believe that's talking about paying monthly through your carrier. So you can pay AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile. You can pay them monthly for the phone and it'd be worked into your cellular bill rather than paying the Apple Card payment or Apple's iPhone upgrade program. So you can do that monthly installment plan with your carrier, but you have to do it through them. Notably, if you do that, you typically don't get Apple Care built in. One of the reasons why I do the iPhone upgrade program is because Apple Care comes with it when you do that through Apple. And so then that's the third option. Apple's iPhone upgrade program. It's basically, again, a 0% interest loan and it goes through Citizens One. So you pay, I think like a hundred down when you pre-order or buy the phone initially. Then you have a monthly payment. Depending on the model and the storage size, you pay monthly. And that monthly payment is actually going to a company called Citizens One, at least here in the United States. And it's basically a loan. You can always choose to just pay off that loan in its entirety with Citizens One if you didn't want to pay monthly anymore. But you pay that monthly payment. And then the reason why it's the iPhone upgrade program is after a year, you can get the new phone. You can mail your old phone away. And whatever you've paid towards that phone, basically that loan disappears kind of, and that your trade-in you know, it was, serves for the balance of the, that old phone. And then you basically start a new loan in the new year with that new iPhone 12, like if you were to start it this year. So if you want to be able to do monthly payments, 
but you don't want to carry that balance on your card and you don't want to go through the carriers, you can do the Apple iPhone upgrade program. It includes Apple Care. You still pay monthly. It's still a loan, but you're not carrying a balance on a card and you do trade in that phone every year. Or you could just keep the phone for two years and over a two year span, you pay the whole thing off and then you own it. You don't have to trade it in unless you want to trade it in value. But what what method do you use, Wes? You big spender, you just like buy the thing outright or do you do one of these plans? I don't keep these things. I don't, I'm not a developer. I don't test anything. I'm not going to hand it down. So I, I go through yeah. Verizon's plan. I've done it ever since whenever they started that a few years ago, where I paid off 50% of it by the following year. And as long as it's 50% paid off, I just ask for the new phone and they send it. And then whatever difference in overall price goes into the calculation for the monthly right. bill. But yeah, it, I like doing it that way. I'm the only problem with it is, is it kind of complicates if you want to just pay it off or own it. You kind of, I think you'd have to make a phone call to Verizon to do that. Right. The Apple Card process, I think, is the most desirable for people who want that cash back. Right. But having having that balance on the card, I think, sucks just because then, what if you want to buy something and it's over the max of your card with the iPhone on it? So it. I think the third option is best for anyone coming into this fresh, but I think I'm just going to stick with Verizon, at least until I get my own Apple card or something to mess with. Do you find that doing it through Verizon, do you ever have issues like on pre-order time? I've always ordered the phone the moment it comes out and got it the day it comes out. I don't think I've ever missed release day uh, on this plan. So um, it's been awkward. Verizon's had issues. Most of the time they open 10, 15 minutes early. So I, I just snipe that very quickly. Every now and then we've seen major issues on Verizon and it almost look like we're just going to be, you know, December getting an iPhone. Nothing crazy so far other than whatever glitches they have. Once it opens, I click order and it's done. So I used to do the AT&T Next plan, which was that upgrade plan you pay monthly. And I think it was with the 6 Plus. I was on AT&T's website like that morning because you couldn't do it through Apple just yet. And like AT&T's website was just could not handle it, just could not handle the amount of people trying to do it. And so it took like, I don't know, half an hour for me to get the order in. And it came several weeks late. So I was just traumatized from that experience. So I do the Apple iPhone upgrade plan. The other nice thing is too, is with Apple's iPhone upgrade plan, if you want to not have to mail your phone away to get that trade in, you know, whatever, you can actually do it in the store. So if you actually want to get the new iPhone and you want to be able to like literally hand someone your old iPhone in an Apple store and you don't have to worry about mailing it away or, you know, whether or not it's going to be lost in shipping. You can actually do that in the store, like the morning of the launch, if you make an appointment and do all that pre-order. So I like the, the regular iPhone upgrade plan through Apple. Plus it comes with Apple care, but those options are available. I will put a link in show notes to it's apple.com slash iPhone slash buy. It talks about all the different options there and you can start the process. But if you're listening to this and you pre-ordered your phone because this show comes out on pre-order day, tweet at Wes and myself, let us know. Did you get a phone? Are you going to get it on launch day? Which one did you get? Regular 12, 12 pro. We'd love to hear about that. Oh, and also one last bit of news, <laughs> Digitimes uh, had the story Thursday as we're recording, but that the pre-orders went live for a carrier in Taiwan, and within 45 minutes, it was sold out. <laughs> so it looks like there might be some pretty strong demand for the iPhone 12 this year, uh, probably because 5G and all that. But anyway, if you want that pre-order, get in there soon. It's 8 a.m. Eastern or pre-orders. It was this morning. If you're listening later in the day, if you didn't pre-order yet by the time you're listening to this, it's probably gone. But if you're one of those really early risers, Jason Aiton, I'm looking at you, uh, you can hopefully listen to this and pre-order the phone that you want. But anyway, tweet at Wester Eye. Tell us what you got. Were you able to get one for launch day? We'd love to hear from you. What you think about the HomePod Mini or any of the other announcements that Apple made? What were you hoping for that you didn't hear about? New Apple TV, the AirPod Studio, AirTags, all that. Uh, you can let us know. Tweet at us. Also, links and show notes to all the many articles that I'm going to reference and the carrier 5G network maps and all that stuff. And don't forget, if you haven't yet, give us a five-star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. We'd greatly appreciate that. It helps us rise the ranks and get discovered by more Apple fans like yourself. And thanks for tuning in, as always. We'll catch you next week. <laughs>